Good morning and welcome to the Harry Jackson Show. I'm your host, Harry Jackson, coming live from the greater Washington, D.C. area, uh, about 25 minutes from the capital, Beltsville, Maryland. What a name. In the industrial age, it sounds like the Rust Belt, but it's Beltsville, and uh, we're excited. This is Faith and Family Friday on the Harry Jackson Show in our second segment where we really always interview a guest, Rick Young, co-author of Amazing Adventures with God, is going to tell a bunch of uplifting stories uh, about specifically the life of someone he's observed and walked with, but ways that God wants to intervene in your life on this Faith and Family Friday. But first, David Parlin and I are going to talk about several issues that are in the news today. First of all, Boehner blasts his Tea Party compatriots in the Republican Party, and uh, that becomes a major issue. Headline in Washington Post this morning is House Passes Budget Accord. Subtitle, Boehner blasts Tea Party critics. We'll come back to that, but I think it's amazing that there is such disunity now within the GOP. It may be the one thing that will absolutely neutralize their efforts in the midterm elections. The unified party could be a winning party for them. There certainly needs to be a lot of alternative uh, operations and actions. We'll come back to that in a moment. Extension for health care. Once again, the administration, which is the executive branch of our government, who should be uh, really moving with execution of a plan as it's written, or another way to think about it is that we've got all the plays in a football game laid out by the coach and the management. Even if you are the quarterback, you're supposed to call the plays that already exist, not make them up as you go. The extension looks like instead of December 23rd, there will be an extension till January 1st, or essentially through the last day of this year, of 2013. We'll come back and talk about what's likely to happen. Uh, Dave Perlette, I believe that this extension won't be the last one. There'll be others. Secondly, Kim Jong-il, uh, uh, he has now uh, executed his uncle. Uh, In the front page article that is on the front page of the Washington Post as well, North Korea says it executed leader's uncle. And uh, Kim Jong-un, forgive me, I said ill. He may be ill, but he is un. Kim Jong-un calls his uncle a traitor for all ages. And it's an amazing thing that Jang Song Chek uh, was executed after admitting his crimes before a military tribunal on Thursday. Confession and then execution in less than 24 hours. That's a new standard for follow through. If you're in jail in America on trial, we may not even come to the trial for a year and a half. And the execution phase is later. Fourth and final story, and then we'll invite Dave Parlett to weigh in on all these things along with me, is that there is an interpreter from the Mandela Memorial. And remember, there are many memorial events. And this particular guy is using it as an excuse. He's supposed to be a deaf, inter- deaf interpreter. And the folks are saying that's the weirdest sign language we've ever seen. He's making up new steps. Uh, I didn't see it all, but I can just imagine somebody out there with a special suit on doing the temptation walk <laughs> and making all these movements. And uh, <laughs> and then he said to the folk, uh, Dave Parlett here in the studio, what happened was I was I was having a schizophrenic episode. Yeah, hearing voices. Hearing voices before the program talking. Uh, to our chief engineer as we were coming in, Ron, we really uh, came to the conclusion that only only the most insane want to use the insanity plea. Of all the things you can come up with, 
of why you messed up. Saying, really, no, seriously, I'm really crazy. Uh, is not, <laughs> it's, it's really not the thing that puts you in the greatest light. Would you all agree? Yeah, he's he's certifiably crazy. I saw his moves and did you? And and yeah, they didn't make sense. I thought he was going to put his hands down on his knees and do do a little crisscross there and a little <laughs> dance. I mean, he had his hand. He pushed them out, pull them in. He did all sorts of movements, but his fingers were never really moving. And then he'd just stand there and motionless. And he said in the article, he was hearing voices, and he didn't want anybody to know. <laughs> well, we knew something was going on. Now, I wouldn't have thought it was any kind of real old vo uh, voice other than maybe Jack Daniels was talking in his ear, you know, or <laughs> that, that, that could have been something. Yeah, there's whatever, a reason. Whatever uh, sake they have over there in Korea, right? <laughs> exactly. Whatever they got going on, but something uh, high proof, high test. In my day of, of pre-Christ and in college, People used to make something called boiler makers with, uh, you know, you take uh, a beer and then you take a hundred proof whiskey and drop a shot of that whiskey literally into the beer. It would submerge, mix in, and then folk would drink a couple of those. Woo! It would have you loopy to say the least. Well, whatever his reason, uh, schizophrenia is not the most common excuse if you're going to say to the teacher, the dog ate my homework on the way to school, maybe you should really make up a far-fetched story. Well, we're having fun, and the world is changing. Back to the seriousness, and I want to applaud uh, John Boehner today for helping to be a part of making sure that there's no budget a uh, crisis that hits the D.C. area again. And uh, I know that folks are going to get paid. That's a good thing. Uh, all the way through Christmas, it might encourage Christmas purchases and all of that. What say you about his criticism of the Tea Party folk, Dave Parlett? What do you think about that? Ooh, I heard his criticism. He was close to almost cursing. He was so angry, <laughs> I think. And... Uh, and, 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 and Christmas spirit. And, and right, rightfully <laughs> so. I mean, it's good to make a clear distinction between the conservatives and the Tea Party. And he's made it he's made it clear that he's not going down that path any further. He's not willing to have any more uh, government shutdowns. People need their jobs. And yeah, yeah, I, I think it's good. They need to have the budget. I think it goes through 2015. Yeah. Well, one of my concerns is that it does take away our local and national concern. Mm. Uh, we were aware that with the shutdown, uh, over 800,000 people had some kind, of, just under a million people, some kind of impact. Folk are talking about in the billions of dollars of damages for those few days. So it's wise that since the GOP and Republican uh, leadership is getting the worst rap about this. It makes sense that he says, hey, we're going to pass it. We're not going to let ourselves go into the midterm elections with this blight on our record. But I don't know that this open disunity is good for the GOP. Right, right. right. They, they need to be uh, able to make the tough cuts. They make Tough choices, but they're not unified enough to do it. And so we need real leaders in Washington, D.C. Uh, to balance a budget. And at least they're doing the best they can do with what they've got. Well, on Tuesday, we heard Michelle Bachman come into the O'Reilly Factor. I happened to be there, saw her in the green room and the makeup room. And uh, her message on the air was, hey, Republicans have the lowest approval ratings of anybody in the Congress. Ironically, Mr. Obama, who's like uh, they used to call Clinton Teflon Don, I uh, mean, nothing sticks to him. And, well, I, I shouldn't say that. His, his ratings as a seated president are abysmal, but his ratings are starting to slowly climb back up. But the Republicans 
have really gotten a bad image that they're the naysayers, the wrongdoers, the bad people. And I don't see this public fighting um, really helping at all. And uh, so we'll tell you anything. Right, right, right. They, they seem to be the party of no, saying no to everything, and they've got to give us a positive direction for the country. We need to hear clear, concise leadership. We certainly do. And I've been saying this. They need a clear message. They need a messenger. They need diversity. Michelle Bachman got it right on this particular issue. Extending the health care. Yesterday we talked on Healthy Thursday about how few the enrollments have been in Obamacare. And even though they, on a federal basis, have quadrupled, it's still a paltry number. And it's an abysmal start and take off. Um, how do you view the fact that folk have been given essentially eight more days to get your get your request in now? Join healthcare. I, I think there's going to come others. What do you think? Other yes. extensions? Oh, absolutely. It it seems to be you know, and and it's a shame because real people, millions of people, really have lost their health care. And when they show up at their doctors in January, will they really have coverage or will they say, hey, we lost this somewhere in the website and we know you you paid, you say you paid, but we really can't find your name. We can't find the information. We're not sure. We're very sorry. Yes, we Mr. lost sick person, you, right? Mr. Sick Person, in the website. Yeah, I love the fact that both parties, Democrat and Republican people, have been saying why didn't they get the Facebook people? Why didn't they get the Google people? Why didn't they get somebody who knows what they're, knows what they're doing to actually weigh in? And um, the reality is that whenever you have a third-party system, meaning you take my money and give it to somebody else, and he has a job to do, but there's no accountability factor, you're going to get the excellence of poor government implementation mentation of various plans. What about justice in North Korea? Well, well, if I was Dennis Rodman, I don't know that I'd want to go back there, you know, <laughs> <laughs> to be there with uh, Kim Jong. But it that is amazing. And I guess because they've got a dictatorship, he can do pretty much what he wants, even to his own family. Well, Kim Jong Un He's probably not going to execute Dennis Rodman, but my goodness, wonder what he did as the uncle. Um, wow, quote we have here is, despicable human scum, Jang, or Yang, who was worse than a dog, perpetrated thrice cursed acts of treachery in betrayal of such profound trust and warmness paternal love shown by the party and the leader for him. Wow. I, 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 I just don't know how you execute your uncle, denounce his birth, and uh, then act like the world is supposed to go along with all of these issues. What about the final story you were mentioning about the man whose picture is in the USA. We've been switching back and forth between Washington Post and USA Today. Under the world segment, we have a picture of this guy who is a memorial interpreter. we got about 30 seconds, David Parlett. Mm -hmm. How would you summarize the lesson to be learned from this? I was certainly concerned whether they really didn't vet him enough to know that if he had been a, a terrorist or a Osama bin Ladenite person, uh, he was standing feet away from hundreds or a hundred world leaders. It wow, could have that's been a great. Very, it could have been very dangerous if he had even plastic explosives they undetected. I, I thought, I said, my God of mercy, he could have really <laughs> woo, gone out in a blaze of glory. Well, I chuckle. It's not really funny, but I really hadn't thought of it that way, and you're right. Somebody who's an imposter, if you will, uh, who's got mental issues, as he claims, being that close to all of these dignitaries and security at an event like that could have absolutely been a nightmare, harrowing, and it could have been an opportunity for somebody who's not 
quote, quote, wrapped too tight to have done irreparable damage to the world leadership. I think you're right. That was a danger and uh, one that we should revisit as we look at planning events in the future. Folks, next segment, we're going to be back with Rich Young and Amazing Adventures with God. Stay tuned to The Harry Jackson Show. With today's Faith to Action commentary, here's Janet Porter. The homosexual agenda has shut down bed and breakfast owners, photographers, bakery owners, and now they're coming after private Christian schools. Myrtle Grove Christian School in Wilmington, North Carolina is a private school. Their policy ensures a child's home life matches the high moral teachings of the Bible and the school. So homosexuals are waging war. Dr. Mark Creech, executive director of the Christian Action League, said, For the gay community to fault Myrtle Grove Christian School for their policy is similar to hog farmer families being upset their kids might be excluded or out of place in a rabbinical school. Their complaints are absurd and another demonstration of the way they would violate religious liberty while hypocritically calling for tolerance. Visit F2A.org for more commentaries and action steps, along with news, links, and much more for your state. Go to F the number two a dot org my name's garrett and a few years ago i went through one of those life-shattering events as i watched my marriage crumble and i became a statistic of divorce now there were some pretty dark days is how could a christian guy get divorced i mean i was the guy who told others how faithful god was and then all of a sudden my shortcomings were made public and there i was a statistic then a couple of great guys reminded me of what God's Word says about a bunch of men and women who goofed up, messed up, and even went through rough stuff like divorce. <laughs> Isn't that just like God to say, hey, I love you anyway, even if you are divorced? Well, today I still don't have it all together, but I do know that Jesus has changed me, restored me, and I'm becoming the dad and the new husband that he wants me to be. If you're there today and you don't think there's any hope, think again. Jesus is ready to spend some time with you on the road to restoration. You can meet him right now. Just call 888-NEED-HIM or chat with us live at needhim.org. I have often told my friends that it's in the waiting for a thing that we have the most trouble. We have good intentions initially to believe God for what we are asking and then the dreaded wait. Once the wait sets in and stays for more than the first hour after our prayer, then doubt sets in. So how is it that we don't believe God past our set time of meditation and prayer? When we pray and we believe, and it's in accordance with the will of God for our lives, the rope is connected between us and the angel that's bringing the answer. And we can look for the manifestation. Once we begin to doubt, that rope is cut. So how can we persist in our belief? Well, the word of God is full of encouragement. Remember the woman with the issue of blood? She said in her thoughts, not audibly, if I could just touch the hem of his garment. It wasn't her big words in prayer. It was her faith. So hold on to your faith and don't cut the rope. Your answer is on the way. With a heart for the Urban Family, I'm today's Urban Woman, Tony Johnson. Connect with us at UrbanFamilyTalk.com. Welcome back to the Harry Jackson Show. I'm your host, Harry Jackson, joined in the studio by Dr. David Parlett. And we have a guest here, Rick Young. We're going to set up his segment by simply saying this, that um, this man is co-author of a book entitled My Amazing Adventures with God. And uh, it seems as though he has given us the story of another gentleman, Lonnie Rex. And uh, Lonnie Rex has uh, touched the lives of many people. Uh, one blurb we have here says that he was the most connected Christian in the world. In the second half of the 20th century, he connected with world leaders and the most influential religious individuals on the planet, among that list would have been Pope John Paul II, Mother Teresa, Mikhail Gorbachev, George H.W. Bush, President Ronald Reagan, and President Vladimir V. Putin, and Muhammad Ali, that iconic sports figure. And uh, we want to hear more about the book and this man, Lonnie Rex, 
from Rick Young. Rick Young, are you there, sir? Yes, sir, I am. Welcome to the Harry Jackson Show. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. Wonderful. Can you give us a a little bit of a blurb about who Lonnie Rex was and what was it about his life that drew you to spend time to help tell a story? I met Lonnie Rex uh, about five years ago. A uh, mutual friend of ours, a friend that uh, went to college with his daughters. Uh, we were at a restaurant one night, and I write books. This is my sixth book. And uh, I had finished a book, and he said, what's your next project? And I said, well, I have a couple of ideas. And I shared those with him. And then he said, you ought to write about my friend Lonnie Rex. And so um, he began to tell me that Lonnie had uh, worked with and met Lincoln Gorbachev and the Pope and uh, Oral Roberts and T.L. Osborne and all these people. And really said it fantastic. Before I knew it, he picked up his phone, and this was like 10, 30 on a Sunday night, called Lonnie and talked to his wife and then talked to him and said, here, talk to Lonnie Rex. First thing I knew, the following Thursday, I was at his house in the Houston, Texas yeah. area, and he began to tell me his stories, and I found them fantastic. And then as I did research into his life, I found back up in various publications, newspapers, things of that nature, where it would talk about the different things that Lonnie Rex had done, and it was just really incredible. Well, wonderful. That's a good introduction. Now, tell us about the fact that he was arrested in Ghana um, yes, for attempting to overthrow the government. Right. Wow. Right. Can you elaborate he, on that a little bit for us? Sure. He he used to do a lot of stuff in in all over the world, but he, he led an organization I call it David Livingston Foundation. They would help uh, orphanages and leper colonies and things like this all over the world. And he had been in and out of Ghana, mm-hmm. with some leper colonies and just various things. In fact, he'd been honored by the government for his humanitarian work. So he went to Ghana, and what his goal was was to bring a moped for a guy that reached out to these leper colonies. It would help his job. He wouldn't have to ride a bicycle. He could take a, a moped. And while he was there, he was wow. first seeing some literature that was going to tell about what some of the things they did to reach out to people with food and medicines and various things. They stopped at the prayer to right. pick it up, and they weren't down the road very far, and I say they, there were about five of them. It was him and his guy there with the leper colonies and another guy from England and so forth. They got stopped, and the government guys pulled them out of the cars and said, uh, you just bought some literature. You're trying to overthrow our government. And they arrested them <laughs> and took them to prison, immediately took them to prison. Mm. And Lonnie was, now, yes, Lonnie's a pretty sharp guy, and saying, so he says, I got to go back to my hotel. I have medicines there, and if I don't go there, I'll have a heart attack, and I'll die. Well, it was true. He did have heart issues, and he did have medicine there, although he wasn't near dying, but nevertheless, he told them this, and they, <laughs> they had, had an American die in their care the year before in that prison. So they decided not wanting to die, so they took him back to the hotel. And he, again, said, I, I have heart issues. I need to lay down and kind of gather myself. And they finally, after some conversation, said, fine. And they left him in his hotel room, and they said, okay, there'd be a guard at the door. And they, they held the door, and he went inside and laid down. And after a few minutes, he didn't hear anything anymore. He picked up his phone. He had a dial tone, and he called Tulsa, which was his base at the time, and said, uh, I've just been arrested. Wow. Now, he was doing missionary work there in Ghana. That was his original purpose for everything? Right, right. Now, it was, now he's very much a Christian, to say the least, and, and involved with stuff, but he was humanitarian at this time, what he was doing there. Like I said, he had leper colonies that he was providing food and medicines for. He had a orphanage or two. He had some other things like that going on in Ghana that he was uh, mm-hmm. leading. And so that's what its purpose was. There, the literature, like I said, just basically it was literature to tell the people about some of the uh, things he could help them with and who to contact and things of this nature. It had nothing to do with the government or anything like that. But they didn't know or care, wow. and most of these guys weren't very literate uh, and so forth, so it didn't matter much what he was written out. Well, I'm, so I'm anyway, intrigued by one of the stories of the night, that you have night, here. And he let him stay there. And if I'm talking too fast, I'm sorry. They let him stay there, and he said, now, I need to get a night's sleep, and or I'm going to die. And so they finally said, okay, 
we'll let you stay here tonight, but we'll take you back to prison in the morning. So he gets up about 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning and looks outside, and the guard is not there, and he starts checking every 5 or 10 minutes, and no one's there. He slips down the hall and down to the lobby, and no one's there, and he reaches out and flags down a, a, a car, which... And Africa taxis don't have, they're not yellow with things on top. They're whatever you can find, basically, that people drive you and you give them money. Many vans, so in, many cases. Yes. I'm sorry? I said there are many vans in many cases. Let me stop right. you in the story. Right. right I've, I've, got, I've got an, this is an intriguing story here. You, know, you say that he's connected with world leaders. And uh, right. I see this story where Vladimir Putin was his personal KGB agent when he was traveling to the Soviet Union. Uh, why don't you tell us uh, just a moment, a little bit about how God used that as a divine connection? Well, Vladimir Putin, okay, when you travel to the Soviet Union during the Cold War, everyone of any, well, everyone is assigned a KGB agent to watch over you, to make sure you didn't go places you weren't supposed to go or talk to people you weren't supposed to talk to. And Vladimir Putin was his. And they got to know each other because it's not a secret, but like these guys hang around on the corners, they're with you. They walk you to your room and say, so I stays outside. And then when you walk out of your room, they're still there. And you walk with them and they, they accompany you everywhere you go. So he went to the Soviet Union several times. Uh, one particular time, he went to the request of. Uh, I think it was the Reagan White House, might have been the Bush White House, the Bush one. Uh, they had just ended right, their... Right, right. So, so how did God war. use this as a divine connection here? Right. And we'll just take well, a God, moment to tell this. Okay, he used it because it created a relationship between him and, of course, especially Russia. And he took those in and out of Russia today, even though he's 85 years old. But when Putin was elected president of Russia, inaugurated, he went to Russia dating the Kremlin as a guest of the Russian government for about 10 days. In fact, they threw him a birthday party because he was there during his birthday. And he, yeah. if he needs, he always, has if he can call him if he wants to go in and out of Russia for any reason at all. And he's distributed Bibles there and things like that to the, uh, to the Russian leaders. There's a, a great story about a president, uh, or she, well, the governor of one of the states, who asked him, could I have a Bible? And he had taken Bibles with him, and he says, I never hold a Bible in my life. And this was back in the early 90s, and uh, this man was, mm -hmm. uh, although the governor of a, country, of a state, and he got to hold the Bible for the first time. And Wonderful. while he talked to me, he says, I, Christian, my mama registered me at the church when I was born. Wow. Folks, you're listening to the Harry Jackson Show. We are talking to an author, Rick Young. We're talking from the theme of a book entitled My Amazing Adventures with God, the story of a man, a missionary, a world traveler named Lonnie Rex. And this man has met with George H.W. Bush, President Ronald Reagan, uh, President Vladimir Putin, Muhammad Ali, Mother Teresa, Mikhail Gorbachev, and those kind of figures. What is your favorite Lonnie Rex story? If we can ask that, Rick Young, we're about halfway through our uh, segment here. Uh, if you could zero in on that main story of all the things in the book that really uh, stuck with you, what would that story be? There's two, but I'll give you, I'll give you the first one. He was requested by the uh, Reagan administration to go to Poland to deliver two ships of powdered milk to the Polish people. And this was back when Poland was still communist, and, uh, but they were having difficult times feeding their people. And so Lonnie went to Poland to distribute this milk. And so he gets okay. there, and he, you have to know Lonnie, but again, he always goes to the top. So the day after he gets there, he's talking to the president, uh, prime minister, whatever his title was, of Poland. And this, of course, was a communist guy. And uh, Jareels, I forgot his name anyway, Lonnie's talking to him, and he says, no problem, we'll distribute your milk for you. Thank you very much. And Lonnie says, I'm not going to give you that milk. If I do, you'll distribute it to the soldiers first, and then it's where they left over the kids to get it. And so the guy kind of laughed and said, 
well, who, how you want to distribute your milk? And Lonnie said, well, what's the second largest organization in the nation of Poland? He said, the, com- the uh, Catholic Church. He said, great, who's in wow. charge? So that's when he met the man who became Pope John Paul II. He was still the cardinal there in Warsaw. So wow. Lonnie set up a meeting. They went over and they met with the cardinal and told him what he had. He said, no problem. He said, I'll make arrangements by tomorrow to have a truck to distribute the milk. And I'll notify all the, the uh, religious schools, the churches, and everything else in the entire country, and they'll be waiting for you, and you'll just go and give them your milk, and, and that way you can distribute it throughout the entire country. So uh, yeah. Lonnie got the milk and went to all the little Catholic churches, Catholic schools, and things of that nature in the entire nation of Poland. In fact, the Pope arranged for him to go to a Protestant church. Lonnie is a Pentecostal holiness, and his father was head of missions for Pentecostal holiness. And the only Protestant church they could find in Warsaw at the time was the Church of Christ. But they were so happy just to find a Protestant church that he could attend, and they made those arrangements. And he was in Poland at that time, oh, about 10 days, while he distributed two shipfuls of milk to the children of Poland. And that led about a year or so later, John Paul, um, a few months later, became the Pope, and... uh, he got a call from the Vatican and said, would you come meet with the Pope? He'd like to see you. And Lonnie wow. went to Rome and then to the, actually the <laughs> summer Vatican to meet with the Pope and mm-hmm. has all sorts of pictures. They threw a special mass for him in English with just the staff of the church of the, um, of the Vatican there in, in the uh, Alps. And it was amazing. They, they had three priests sing, uh, this is the day in English just for him because that's the only song they knew in English. <laughs> so this is this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, and they sang it just yeah. for you. Oh, that's that's exciting. I laughed because I know that little ditty, and uh, that's amazing thing. So we've only got about a minute left in the, with this segment. Give us a shot at giving us a condensed Reader's Digest version of your second uh, favorite story about Lonnie Rex. And these would be all in your book, My Adventures with God. Uh, right. authored by you, Rick Young. Right. Go for it, Rick. Okay, Lonnie well, had gone to Russia to help kill Gorbachev throw a telephone to raise money for the widows and orphans of the, their Afghanistan war. The Russians did not tell the women and so forth that their husbands had died in the war. They were widows and didn't know it. They were still receiving the, the uh, their income from their dead husbands. Wow. Once the war was over, they had to tell them why they weren't coming home. And that's because they were dead. So they were going to have a big telethon. And first off, they didn't know how to have a telethon, and Lonnie showed them. They had no credit cards or checks, so they had to have a telethon where everybody would bring their money to the local TV station in cash because that's mm-hmm. what they could do it. Well, the next day after the telethon when he got this call from this guy, and he, I, I told the little Beeble story real quick, but it's much longer, of course, in the book. Well, then the guy said, we have a problem. He said, what's the problem? He said, we have too many potatoes. And potatoes in Russia are like rice in other parts of the world. It is their staple mm-hmm. for their for their food. So uh, Lonnie said, what's the problem? He said, we have too many. And Lonnie looked at the guy, and this is just him and another guy alone in a room. He said, why don't you uh, send your soldiers up there? You still have a huge war, but I'm told the Cold War is over. And just send the soldiers up there, have them help harvest the potatoes, take them in their troop trucks they can use to bring the potatoes back. He said, they keep half. They give half to the people because you're going you're gonna to want for your soldiers anyway. That way, none waste. The people get potatoes. Your soldiers get potatoes. And everybody's a winner. And the guy says, wow, mm-hmm. never thought about that. So he calls a general in. He tells the general the story. Lonnie then takes the story and just makes it more elaborate and tells him what he can do and how he can do it and so forth. And the general goes, wow. So he calls in his top generals that work with him on the staff. And they tell the story again. And so, wow, we'll do this. So then he calls in some more soldiers, more generals or whatever, and he says, okay, get your troops organized, tells them how to do it, and head them north to go to go harvest potatoes. And uh, he gets up there. Well, that night, Ronnie gets back to his room. His son calls him from the United States and says, Dad, are you still in, in Russia? And he said, yeah. He said, get out, get out. They're going to have a war. They have all these troops yeah. going north. You're listening to the voice of Rick Young from Amazing Adventures with God, great author, Great stories about Lonnie Rex. We'll be right back after this break. Yeah, cause I'm a business man. I 
I believe one of the greatest needs for this generation is for men to be men. Pastor, author, musician, Carl King. Men have lost their initiative and they're spending time in games and pornography and, and the culture is vomiting this out and many men are just sucking it up. But I, I think that the Word of God and I think that our culture is, is asking for men to step up and say, okay, I'm gonna use that manliness that God has given me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be a provider. I'm going to be a help. I'm going to be a protector. I'm gonna stand up. I'm not gonna use and exploit women. By me being self-controlled and self-disciplined, I'm gonna change the world. Advancing truth, wisdom, and empowerment. UrbanFamilyTalk.com Dr. Tony Evans says we need to follow the Bible's instruction to put on the belt of truth, even when that belt gets a little uncomfortable. He offers these insights as he brings us the alternative view. John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth and the life. Jesus says, I am truth. So truth is not only a book, it is a book, but it's also a person. It's the written word and it's the living word. So get up dressed in truth. In other words, walk around with a viewpoint that God is true and I am not. Neither is anybody else who disagrees with him. Now, people going to call you arrogant. Are they going to call you narrow? That's a big one. You are so narrow. Yeah, well, if I have a heart problem, I don't want nobody cutting on my leg. I want him to narrow it to my chest. <laughs> I want him to be narrow. On a one-way street, I don't want somebody driving down the other way saying, it's too narrow to only go one way on this street. I want him to be narrow. And if you're going to stand against the devil, you better get narrow, because broad is the way that leads to destruction. And narrow is the road that leads to life. You've got to be narrow enough to say this is true and this is not, thus saith the Lord. If you need help connecting with the power and freedom Christ died to give you, visit us at TonyEvans.org for details about Dr. Evans' book, Victory in Spiritual Warfare. And pray about passing these important concepts on to the people in your church or study group. We have a DVD-based Bible study great for small groups and Sunday school classes, along with study guides and everything you need. Again, that's TonyEvans.org. You've been listening to The Alternative View. Welcome back to The Harry Jackson Show. I'm your host, Harry Jackson. In the last segment, we heard from Rick Young, co-author of a book called My Amazing Adventures with God, the story of a gentleman called Lonnie Rex. And uh, Lonnie Rex did some amazing things. One of the things that was interesting about him, he had polio. Uh, He had to fight this uh, dreaded disease. Uh, And uh, the gentleman uh, met a lot of world leaders, uh, did some powerful missionary work, in Africa, in Europe, around the world. And we had a very, very quick uh, interview. And uh, that book uh, is a great read, I'm told. And uh, it is something that we should reach out for. Again, thank you, Rick Young, co-author of My Amazing Adventures with God. In this final segment, we are going to spend some time talking about Nelson Mandela, and going over some of the leadership lessons of his life, I guess the best way of of saying this is that Nelson Mandela's death at the beginning of Christmas season this year really marks the end of an era in the civil rights struggle of South Africa. Uh, They have integrated, gone to one man, one rule, a lot of great things. But at the same time, Mandela has become an iconic example of forgiveness and the Christian goal of peace on earth. So it's really worthwhile that he is talked about uh, during the Christmas season. There's a lot that could be said. They provide, the key thing for me is that 
Uh, this man was born, uh, Roli Shasla Mandela, uh, was born into the Madiba clan in Mevezo Transkai on July 18th, 1918. And uh, he was born to Nangrafi Nosaniki and Nikos Menfen Kayaniswa. Got Glada Mandela. That's four names. And I think I butchered all four of them, but it's all right. And uh, his father was a prime Mary counselor uh, for the acting king then of the uh, Thimbu people. And uh, it's interesting that Mandela's father died when he was just about eight uh, years old almost nine years old around that time. And he spent primary school in Christian schools. And he was given as his Christian name, the name Nelson. And uh, we could say the rest is history, but he was really educated at Christian schools and a Wesleyan secondary school of some repute, reputation for great academics. And we have a lot of leadership lessons we have learned. There's a great book out on that topic, Eight Lessons on Leadership from Mandela. So today we want to talk about courage. And uh, this author who wrote about Mandela said that during the 1994 um, election campaign, Mandela was heading in a, in a helicopter to a landing, went through a very challenging time. He was going to an area called the Killing Fields of Natal, and which is sort of like north, uh, east, central part of uh, South Africa. And he, the plane began to malfunction, and they landed, were whisked into a bulletproof BMW, and they thought, that Mandela could very well be assassinated or killed during that time. And everybody during this helicopter incident was looking at Mandela, seeing how he was faring, and he looked like the absolute picture of peace, tranquility, the rock of Gibraltar. And then when he got into the limousine, uh, facing the rigors of him being on the ground, he said, wow, that was very scary. And uh, so the author says that Mandela often looked like the picture of peace and stability, had the ability to calm others down when things were getting out of control, but he simply would summon his self-control, although he had to fight fear like everyone else. Is that a great leadership lesson, you think? Mm. You have to portray, you have to allow your people who are following you to see that you're strong, you're not giving up every leader in history, whether it's George Washington or Nelson Mandela, you got to stand strong so your people follow you. Otherwise, they run, <laughs> they run back to the woods. Well, it's interesting, interesting thing. The second thing is a little bit challenging as we look at the critici- criticism of our President Obama where he talks about leading from behind. Uh, Number two rule says lead from the front. Don't leave your base behind. And so our biographer said that Mandela launched into his own negotiations with apartheid folks. He took a lot of risk. He was pushing the issue of one man, one vote, with all the authority that he had, and people misunderstood it. Some of his folks thought he was selling out because he had secret talks uh, with the establishment government, and he wanted to make sure that bloodshed was not the way that people took out their frustrations, anger, and tried to change their situation in South Africa. What would you say about that? a lead from the front. Mm. That, that's certainly the best way to lead to. You're inspiring your people to follow you uh, by giving clear direction. 
guidance. And if you're the guy standing up there with the flag in your hand, taking the shots, you got the target on your back, and everybody else can see that you're willing to lead, it's more natural for the followers to follow. Well, I, I think in contrast, so many of us, our concern, I would say I would have the temptation as well, that if things you initiate don't work out, if the talks you're actively associated with aren't successful, it, it makes you seem as though your judgment isn't good. Uh, but Mandela basically thought that his role was to be something of a change agent in his generation, and he took risk. So third lesson is lead from the back, the exact opposite, which means he felt let others feel like they're engaged in transformative discussions, let others take credit, let others be active agents, and give them guidance so simultaneously you think ahead, you know what you want, but also there are places where you need to have others initiate. And I think I don't want to compare Mandela with Obama or Mandela with Bush or Mandela with Reagan. I'll simply say knowing where to send others as spokespersons and those who engage uh, the culture is really uh, a neat trick um, if you can do it. Sounds like it takes incredible judgment. What do you think? Mm -hmm. I think it's important for people to, to be able to encourage your people to buy in, put some skin in, in the game, and uh, you can say, hey, Mr. Leader, you can count on me. I'm going to be right there with you. And so it's important to lead from behind. That's interesting. Lesson number four of Mandela is Know your enemy, and then as a subcolon, the author of this leadership book says that learn about his favorite sport. In other words, figure out what people like, what their passions are, and it's told the story of P.W. Botha, who was the leader at the time that Mandela began to come into power, uh, that... He really learned how to speak, understand uh, the Afrikaners. He knew a great deal about their history. And uh, he really also brushed up on his knowledge of things like rugby, which were not a uh, part of the, uh, the culture, if you would, of his little tribe on the Eastern Cape. But it was at the very heart of the Afrikaners' Um, kind of uh, culture, there was a great, great, great movie that came out not too long ago that showed um, this gentleman from uh, Matt, Damon. Matt Damon and uh, Man Morgan, Freeman. Morgan Freeman. That's the name, man's name I was searching for. That so I was going to say, please help, help, give me that name. Morgan Freeman was Mandela. And I understand he did a great job. Others are saying that uh, Mr. Idris Elba uh, has also done a great job on a movie that's out now uh, about Mandela. But in that show about rugby, it showed that when he took power, Mandela promoted the rugby team, uh, promoted everyone in the nation kind of rallying around what could have been seen as a favorite game of our oppressors. Now that we're in the struggle, we need to throw off all their stuff, bring in all our stuff. But he had an understanding of culture and the ability to help the nation celebrate its unique combined culture. I really know that we have not been able to do that yet in America as it relates to black versus white, Hispanics versus white. What say you? It's, it's another important point in connection and causing people to be endeared to the leader. If they have a way of connecting with the people, then it's going to rally the people. Together. Well, President Obama loves basketball. Yeah. Basketball is an American game, so is football. But they, we haven't found anything that perhaps identifies one side 
in such a familiar way that it's a way of giving honor to and connecting others to our folk. Uh, perhaps it would be north versus south or uh, west versus east regional uh, habits that could bring us together. Point number five, keep your friends close and your rivals even closer. We've heard that before. But again, in private meetings, Madiba, Mr. Mandela would, in fact, get some kind of relationship going with people, talk behind closed doors long before anything was leaked or shared with uh, the public about what he was doing, what he was up to. What do you think about that, sir? I think it's important to know what your what your friends or enemies, if they're your re, if they're your rivals, you need to keep an eye on them, bring them up close, <laughs> and keep an eye and see what are they saying. Uh, have a little input, get a feel of where they are, because you're trying to build a community, and you don't want to get uh, 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 hit from behind. So you know who your friends or who your enemies are, and does somebody have your back, or are they going to stab you in the back? Well, I, I think the backstabbing aspect of things is unfortunate, and it will happen uh, almost anyway. A couple other things that really I found in various readings about Mandela, this, these next couple are from another source, uh, but one person said that Mandela's compassion ties in with knowing the sports of your enemy, that he had the ability to be compassionate. He had the ability also to identify with every man. And um, I think it's really uh, later in his life, after Robin Island, that he came to believe himself in forgiveness. And uh, when I was on the O'Reilly Factor earlier this week, we talked about his life transformed through the power of transition forgiveness, rather, allow the transformation and transitioning of his entire nation because of how he embraced, led the way, demonstrated and modeled forgiveness to his fellow countrymen. What say you about this issue of compassion and understanding other people? I think that's a true uh, nature of a great leader like Pope Francis even today, getting in with the people, this compassion, showing that you really care. Wonderful. I, I think it really is critical. They also said Mandela was a great listener, and he was an agent of empowerment. Many people said that his approach was to be informed, and to take into consideration all opinions uh, of our team before stepping um, into a final decision-making mode. And it seemed like that was a major, major aspect of his life. Folks, you've been listening to the Harry Jackson Show. I'm your host, Harry Jackson. Yeah, the voice you've heard recently was David Parlett. This has been Faith and Family Friday. Don't forget to go to church this Sunday. Tell God you're thankful and return back here on Monday for more of the Harry Jackson Show. We'll be waiting for you then.